Karma is an oriental word which has found its way into most English dictionaries. It stands for a principle of Eastern philosophy which is variously interpreted. To the average Western thinker, particularly uh, the theologian, the term is objectionable, although the equivalent is found in the New Testament. As we are told in the New Testament, as a man soweth, so shall he reap. And this is very largely the traditional explanation or interpretation of the word karma. It also is found in the Buddhist scriptures, where Buddha says, effects follow their causes, as the wheels of the cart follow the foot of the oxen. Therefore, we are dealing with cause and effect. We are not dealing with punishment per se. We are not referring to a condition after death or in life in which evil forces take over the life or consciousness of a human being. We are not relating to demonology nor to a Hades populated by ghosts and monsters. The word is simply a term to signify that the effects are inherent in their causes. Scientifically, this would probably not be seriously disputed. We observe every day that causes produce consequences. But most people are so much interested in their own ideas about consequences that they overlook the problem of causation. Today, as we look around us, we see an almost classical example of how causes produce their effects, how the way we do things becomes the way in which we are rewarded or punished. Karma is not a punishment bestowed by heaven. It is not a painful uh, work given by deity to wayward children. Karma is simply the fact that there are rules in the game of life, rules in creation, rules that are just as inflexible as the law of gravity, rules that cannot be violated. And long ages of contemplation has built these rules into the theological writings of most of the nations of the world. These rules are first observed. Our remote ancestors saw them. They did not know what they meant, and they did not know why they happened. But they learned through thousands of years of experience that things that they did had consequences, and that these consequences were more or less inevitable. They found in those days that the individual who broke the common rules of life suffered. He suffered not because a divine power looked down on him and punished him. He suffered simply because he broke the law of cause and effect. This law is impersonal. It is just. It cannot be arbitrated and it cannot be not mollified or changed by almost any process that we can think of. Actually, therefore, we live in a world in which we have to be thoughtful of what we do if we wish to enjoy the maximum benefits of existence. The purpose of knowledge, finally, is to discover what we can do that does not result in trouble. Ignorance, <laughs> consequently, is the condition of being unaware that what we do has consequences. Now, we are mostly willing to accept certain visible forms of consequences. We know that if we eat the wrong foods, we will have dyspepsia. We know that if we become bound to drugs or narcotics or alcohol, we will pay for this indiscretion. We know that we are capable of improving our living or destroying ourselves. 
according to our understanding and application of the principles of cause and effect. So the philosophy has as its primary purpose an effort to demonstrate clearly for the benefit of all concerned that you cannot make a mistake without getting into some kind of trouble. Now, we can say that people do not know when they make a mistake. In certain cases, this is true. But in the majority of instances, the mistake is intentional. It is intentional because the individual is more interested in getting something that he wants or avoiding something he should face than he is in thinking about the law of cause and effect. He thinks that evasion is possible, which it is not. He thinks that he can overlook rules in nature and that nature will overlook these mistakes. It will not happen this way because practically every mistake that can be made has consequences which are unfavorable. Now, of course, we can't all be perfect in everything. We will all be subject to the mistakes for a long time to come. But one of the commonest things that we might be able to do would be to build a pattern of the more common, simple, and obvious mistakes and how to avoid them. We should be teaching children certain rules to avoid mistakes on the consequential theory that this, these rules must be followed or, so, or trouble will follow. So karma becomes in our personal living as a force to take the place of the uh, purgatories of ancient theologies. Instead of the individual going to some mysterious place after death where he will be boiled in oil, <laughs> he can uh, escape this very morbid and melancholy fact by realizing that the effects of causes are worked out on the same plane where the causation occurs. If we make a mistake on the physical level, we will pay for it physically. If we do something noble and glorious on the, uh, the physical level, we will be rewarded accordingly. Karma is much, as much deals with rewards as it does with punishments. If our mistakes are never overlooked, our virtues are not forgotten either. Everything we do right has certain enduring consequences for our betterment, improvement, and security. Therefore, karma actually is impersonal. It has nothing really to do with what we want or what we do not want. Karma has to do with what we have done, why, and how. It has to do with the simple payment of debt. It is like the individual who borrows more money than he can pay and in the end lands in bankruptcy. This is not because God determined uh, to break him. It is not because these laws are written in the scriptures. It is really because the individual has done something he should not do. And he either did it from, the, from ignorance or from intent. Now, in the philosophies of life, ignorance is no excuse beyond a certain point. The individual who makes mistakes he doesn't know about and has no way of estimating can get into some trouble, but there are forms of forgiveness or Bob or Bard in Gilead which will help him. But the individual generally does not have unintentional mistakes because the things he does while he, get, while he gets mistakes are things he knows about and therefore knows that he shouldn't have done them and often regrets even before the results set in. Now this leaves many people in the arms of a quandary. If everything we do has consequence, suppose we do nothing. Suppose we wrap up in isolation and sit like St. Simon Stalites on the top of a column in the Libyan desert. We, we don't speak to anyone. We don't do anything. We live as nearly helplessly as possible. Ask no one for anything and tell no one anything. 
would this settle karma? Yes, it would. But what is the karma of taking that attitude? <laughs> the individual who sits alone long enough is paying karma right at that moment. He has given up making one kind of a mistake, has made another, and is sitting alone in the desert trying to understand the new mistake that he has just made. <laughs> to do nothing, therefore, is not a solution. The only proper solution is to try through study, thought, and ex experience to do those things which are useful. From the moment of birth on, the individual is subjected to factors and factions with which he must contend. He must adjust to a world which perhaps he does not fully appreciate or does not wish to tolerate. But actually, he is here for a purpose. We are all here for one purpose primarily, and that is to grow. No matter what we think of it, this world is a schoolhouse. And in this schoolhouse, we are here to learn lessons. And the two factors that are important in our education are, is the education itself correct, and have we the courage and to follow it if it is. Young people should understand that law, cause and effect, or karma, is not theological. It really has nothing to do with the religious beliefs of people. It has appeared in, in almost every religion because it is a dominant factor in ethics. But law of cause and effect is not part of theology. It is just as much part of science or philosophy or ethics or art or literature. It is part of a complete pattern of life. It rules the businessman and it rules the poet. It governs the doctor and the bishop. These rules are all uh, applicable to every walk of life, but they are definitely based upon a simple concept. You cannot do anything without causing a consequence of some kind. Now, of course, the, the knack of it, we might say, is to keep on doing those things with the consequences of which are enjoyable. Karma, therefore, is not merely an instrument of punishment. Karma gives us just as many rewards as it seems to give us penalties. But both the rewards and penalties are due to ourselves. We are the maker of karma and destiny in our own personal lives. There is no way of blaming this upon some vast universal mystery. Actually, of course, cause and effect is recognized in most sciences. It is recognized in law and medicine. It is recognized in ethics and most of the philosophical systems of the world. But it is there because it is just as much a part of us as breathing or blood pressure or any of the anatomical, physiological, or uh, biophysical functions of the human being. So having settled in our own minds one simple point, that what we do is the basis of what we are, and what we are doing now is the basis of what we will be in times to come, we then come upon another attitude that has arisen which is more theologized, and that is what we are doing now may have a relationship to the past. Are we paying old debts now? This is a serious matter because there has been some discontent and disparagement of this concept. Actually, however, the individual comes into this life with his past inside of him. It is part of his consciousness. It is part of his experience. Therefore, in most instances, the individual sets his past to work again in this life. When he grows up selfish, he might have brought the selfishness with him because it was part of the fact that he had not outgrown it. But that's